Hello my fellow investors, I've been working on this video for a very long time and I mean mentally working on it, not physically working on it and basically what I was trying to do is to make myself a list of the most basic and important principles of value investing and I made a list of 10 things and I'll say this is for me the most important and basic principles. Maybe for other people, um, there'll be other principles that will be more important or less important. There's nothing right or wrong about this list, in my opinion. I, I think every person is wired differently, and for some people, there are things that are more important, and for some people, there are things that are less important. Some people have um, naturally um, good characters that they don't need to work on it. Some people need to work on other things. So I don't think there's anything right or wrong about this list. It's just... This is my list of my 10 most important principles. And I just want to say that this list is about uh, investment strategies. It's not about things that have to do with temperament or personalities. So before before I start going through this list, I want to um, play here a clip of Irving Kahn and his son Tom Kahn on, on investment, on value investing. And uh, maybe uh, I'll give a little bit of a... a a richer perspective on, on the way I look at this whole thing. I have questions too. And while you're thinking, maybe I'll just uh, ask uh, Irving. Irving, um, a question that came up was whether value investing was an art or science. What would you say, uh, Irving and uh, perhaps Tom? My son and I don't always agree, but we both agree that it's an art in the sense that you never saw a great painter it didn't learn as a protege or some master painter. And also that how great a man might be, he could paint some bad pictures too. But it's no science, and all the kids who believe in the equations or rules that they will make for perfect markets will learn better as they get older. Prem, if, if it were a science, it would be replicatable. You could uh, put certain algorithms in the machine and and you could pop out the answer, and, and it doesn't work that way. So it has to be an art. Okay, so now that we got this out of the way, that value investing is an art and not a science, so let me paint my painting, what's my 10 basic principles of value investing, and that's value investing strategies. Now, I'm not talking about temperament and other things. Okay, so number one is circle of competence. I, for me, this is the most important uh, principle of value investing. And the reason for that is like this. I, I'll take each uh, each subject, each issue, and I'll try to get into it in a deeper understanding. Investing in a company or an industry that you don't understand is folly. And no matter if it's in real estate or business or trading or value investing, whatever it is, you have to know what you're doing. And it's not only investing in a company or industry you don't understand. Another point is also the kind of investment strategy you do. So in investing in a way you don't understand or doesn't resonate with you is, is a recipe for disaster. It's the same thing. You have to know what company you're investing in and you have to understand the investment strategy you're using. So if you're good at cigar butts, so stick with cigar butts. If you're good at compounding machines and great companies, stick with that. You can't invest in something you don't understand and you can't invest in a way you don't understand. And... So the way I look at it, if you're investing out of your circle of competence, you're not a value investor. You're a speculator. So for me, this is the most basic principle. Value investing is buying value. If you don't know what you're doing, then you don't know the value of what you're buying. You don't understand the risk that you're taking. That you, you can never, I, I will never be able to consider someone who's investing out of a circle of competence as a value investor. And so a circle of competence is pretty famous uh, I think everyone knows what it is. I just I bring you Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. It doesn't matter how big your circle of competence is, just you have to stay inside your circle of competence. That's a famous uh, Warren Buffett quote. And uh, Charlie Munger says, the more you grow and you, you, you expand, you, you have more experience, so you need to try to, to broaden your circle of competence. And I want to bring you a video of Warren Buffett on circle of competence and Charlie Munger on this issue. Defining your circle of competence is the most important aspect of investing. 
It's not how important, uh, how, how large your circle is. You don't have to be an expert on everything. But knowing where the perimeter of that circle of what you know and what you don't know is and staying inside of it is all important. Tom Watson Sr., who started IBM, said in his book, he said, I'm no genius, he said, but I'm smart in spots and I stay around those spots. And, and you know, that is the key. Uh, so if I understand a few things and I stick in that arena, I'll do okay. And if I don't understand something, but I get all excited about it because my neighbors are talking about it, the stocks are going up and everything, they start fooling around someplace else, eventually I'll get cream, and I should. Yeah, I think that if you have competence, you almost automatically have a feeling of where the edge of the competence is. Because after all, it wouldn't be much of a competence if you didn't know its boundary. And uh, so I think you've asked a question that almost answers itself. Uh, and my guess is you do know what you're in all kinds of areas. And you do have all kinds of other areas where you know you'd be over your depth. I mean, you're not trying to play chess against Bobby Fischer or, or uh, do stunts on the high trapeze if you've had no training for it. Well, my guess is you know pretty well where the boundaries of your competence lies. And I think you also probably know pretty well where you want to stretch the boundary. And you've got to stretch the boundary by working at it, including practice. Okay, I, I forgot to say in the beginning of this video that I'll be very happy to hear all your comments, what you think is a uh, different list or something that needs to go in or go out. I'll be very happy to hear what, you, what your thoughts about it in the comments. Um, number two is reducing risk. And I think this um, issue is uh, very much overlooked. Uh, that's, that's my opinion. I think people forget how important it is to reduce risk. And the way I like to say the art of investing is reducing risk which leaves the investor only with upside. If you have an uh, investment, and as much as you can, and and whatever the common sense and logic says is that the risk is not an issue, then basically you only have an upside. The more there's risk, the more you have a potential of losing your investment. So I think like what it's, it's, it's a, uh, Charlie, uh, Charlie Munger has a famous saying, invert, always invert. I mean, you always have to think of what could possibly go wrong. If you take out all the options as much as possibly can be of reducing risk, then you have a good investment. But if you don't think about the risk that's in, in the investment, that's a major, major um, way of of losing money. I mean, potentially losing money. And this applies to real estate, to bonds, to trading, to value investing, to any, any kind of business. I mean, the first thing of, of, of business is to reduce the risk as much as possible. And... It's impossible to predict the future, but if you, d you could eliminate as much risk uh, potential as possible, that's the best thing to do. So if it doesn't make a difference if it's a carbon investing or for the growth companies. You have to try to reduce the risk as much as possible and then just let the upside take care of itself. And I want to bring here a, a video of Howard Marks on this issue. And I have another story that I think is... Uh, it points out this point, this issue very, very, very strongly. So the first one says that the, the most important thing is risk control. And we tell the clients, we think that for, a, for excellence in investing, the most important thing is not be making a lot of money. It's not beating the market. It's not being in the top quartile. The most important thing is controlling risk. That's our job. That's what we'll do for you. And the clients come to us who want to invest in our asset classes with the risks under control. There are other people who... Who, who put less emphasis on controlling risk, and they have better results in the good times and worse results in the bad times. Our clients want what we give them. I heard this story uh, years and years ago, and it made a very profound um, impact on my view on investing. The story goes like this. I have no idea if it's true or not, but the points are very, very, very valid. Um, hundreds of years ago in Europe, there was this logger um, he used to rent a lease um, forests from noblemen, landowners, dukes, whatever you want to call them in Europe. And the way 
these contracts used to work, they used to lease the land for a certain period of time, and they used to get the rights to fell trees, to log trees, and then they used to bring it, uh, they used to pull it with oxen as horses to the river, and they used to float it down to the to the city and sell it as logs or trees, whatever it is. And this logger became older and older, he was a very successful businessman, and as he became older, his kids started taking over the business. One day his kids come over to him and they say, listen, we got this amazing investment. Um, what did you say about it? So he started asking him a long list of questions. And he tells him, listen, I think it's a bad investment. Don't do it. But, you know, his kid said, okay, dad is becoming old. He doesn't understand already. He forgot already what it is to invest. They decided to go and do the contract. And what happened was like this. They, they used to uh, log the trees in the winter when the whole, f- when the, when the, when the, land was frozen and the horses and the oxen used to be able to pull the logs. They used to pull the logs until till the river and they used to float it down in the summer when the river was um, unfrozen. And what happened that year when they logged the trees that the, it was a very, very hot winter and all the snow melted and the horses, the oxen, they couldn't pull the logs. It was Everything was all mushy. And until finally, finally, they were able to bring it down to the river. It took a long time because the forest is very far away from the river. And by the time... Uh, um, the winter was over, the logging was over, and the summer was over. They, we, it, the, the logs came to the to the river. Winter came early, and the river froze, and they couldn't uh, float the logs down the river. And by the time the contract is over, and the entire investment went down the drain. So the kids came over to the father and said, how did you know that the winter is going to be so hot and all the snow would melt? He said, I didn't know. I had no idea. He said, how did you know that the next winter would come early and the river would freeze? He said, I didn't know either. So he said, so why did he say it was a bad investment? He said, I asked you a few questions. One of my questions was, how long is the lease? You told me it's only one year. And I know a lease it's only one year. That's a big risk factor. And then I asked you, how far is the forest from the river? And you told me it's two miles away. And I said, okay, so now we have another factor. It's a huge risk factor. The forest is far away and it's a very short lease time. And these two risks when together seem to me as a, too much of a high risk and a bad investment that's what I told you not to do it I didn't know what's going to be in the summer I didn't know what's going to be in the winter but the connection of these two major risks told me this is a bad investment and what I learned from this story was that the first thing in investing is to reduce risks you have to reduce as much risk as possible and the more knowledge you have the more experience you have the more you know how to reduce uh, risk. So this is just a very a profound story that I heard years ago and I don't know if it's true or not but I think the point is very 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 valid. Okay my next uh, issue is margin of safety. Now you can ask what's the difference between reducing risk and margin of safety and in some point it's it's very right it's like it, it, we could say that the, the basic uh, principle of all value investing is common sense. Common sense tells us to invest only in the circle of competence. Common sense says to reduce risk. Common sense, common sense tells us to use the margin of safety. It's all true. But the common sense takes all different kinds of aspects and it's applied in t- totally different ways. You have to break down the common sense in different categories. So for me, reducing risk is don't invest in an investment that has major risks. Margin of safety is just another way of reducing risk. It just takes on, it's applied in different um in, in different ways. So, so what's margin of safety? So for me, the basic of investing and trading is to have a margin of safety. And so what does that apply? So let's say you're buying a cigar butt and, and you're buying a, a dollar for 90 cents. So there's no margin of safety. Maybe you're wrong. Maybe the dollar isn't worth a dollar. It's worth more like 95 cents. And the company is going to lose money and the 95 cents tomorrow is going to be worth 90 cents and it didn't do anything. Or if you're buying a growth company and you think it's going, it's, it's, it's growth is 15, 20% or whatever it is and you're buying it at a, a, a very overpriced uh, valuation. So again, there's no margin of safety. Even if you're right, maybe the growth will be a little bit lower and you have to use a margin of safety when you're investing. It's, it's the price. It's a lot of different things. And Another thing about margin of safety is an investor can always be wrong. And if margin of safety is applied, then the loss on mistakes will be minimized. If you're buying, um, let's say, a cigar butt that uh, you think it's a dollar for 50 cents, 
and the company didn't do so well, and they're losing money. But you bought it for such a low valuation that even if you were wrong and you, you need to get out of it, you're still not going to lose a lot of money. But if you bought a, a dollar for 90 cents and the company's losing money and it's going down to 70 cents, you lose much more money. Another thing in, in margin of safety is even if the investor was right, without a margin of safety, the investor is basically putting himself in a position where any bad turn of events can ruin their investment. So you can never predict the future. You can never know what's going to happen. Things could go bad. And that's why you always need a margin of safety. And another thing about margin of safety is margin of safety should, should be applied in valuing the assets of the company. That means you, you're going through the balance sheet and you're not sure about something. So just take a margin of safety and always take it at the lower valuation. And it's also about valuing future earnings or growth. Always use your margin of safety. It Maybe it's not going to grow as much as you think, it's going to grow a little bit less. And any issue that you have, that you're not sure, you have doubts about it, Always just take a margin of safety. I think that's the best um, way to as, as reducing risk as much as possible. Okay, the next thing is diversification. And I think everyone knows what diversification is. It's just a question is how to apply it. And it, it could change very, very, very much. I just want to point out uh, a few points. And it, it, it could be a huge list. So I'm, I'm just going to point out a few things and I always like to rethink these things and maybe enrich myself with deeper ideas about it. But I'm just going to, um, to point out my, 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 my view. Diversification is very important and, and it is in the essence the outcome of reducing risks. Again, if you put all your investment into, into like they say, don't put all your eggs in one basket. It's you're reducing risk by diversification and even if you have the best company in the world, something will go wrong. Sometimes it could be foreseen, sometimes it can't be foreseen, sometimes change of events, anything will go wrong. So diversification is just another way of reducing risk. Um, diversification uh, changes shape and form from person to person and in time. Um, so I'll give you an example. Let's say a person who owns real estate and he has a stable job and he has a few streams of revenue, of income. So for him, it will be less important um, to diversify the portfolio, the investment portfolio, like someone who doesn't have a real estate, doesn't, doesn't own real estate, and uh, let's say he has only a stable job. And for an investor who, who doesn't have any real estate and he doesn't have any savings, he's scrapping every single penny he has to invest. So for him, it's even more important to diversify his uh, portfolio. So you can't say what's the right way to diversify. It depends on a lot of different things. It depends on the person, how much money he has, what does he own, does he have um, any assets. So it's very hard to put any exact number or any exact way to do it. Each person has to use his common sense in the way he needs to diversify. And another thing about uh, stocks and bonds. So it wouldn't be a major issue for a young investor who's saving for retirement to have all his portfolio in his stocks. But as he's growing older and he wants to retire, it would be... I think a little bit dumb to have all his investments in stocks if he wants to use this portfolio as retirement. So it will make more sense before he's retiring, like five, ten years before he's retiring, to diversify at least some of his portfolio into bonds. So if he wants to retire and he needs this as income, he should be able to have bonds that will give him a fixed income. Again, if he has, if he's a rich person and he has real estate and he has revenue, whatever it is, so that's something else. So but I'm just pointing this out. And another point, it would be smart for an investor who owns real estate to diversify the stock portfolio in, in companies that are not related to real estate. If he has a, a huge amount of his, his assets, of his, of, his, of his value, of his net worth in, in real estate, so why have all your investment also in real estate when you own real estate? Why not diversify to other uh, industries? The same thing would apply for someone who, has a, a, who works in big tech, in high tech. So it will be smarter for him to diversify his investment portfolio into companies that have nothing to do with high tech. And, of course, it has to be inside a circle of competence, but um, I'm just pointing this out, that you don't need to look only on your stock portfolio. You have to look at the entire um, your entire assets besides your portfolio, what you work in, what you do, what you know. I'm just pointing out a few, a few valid points. And I want to bring here a, a, a clip of Warren Buffett on diversification. The question is about diversification, and I've got a dual answer to that. If you are not a professional investor, if, you're, if your goal is not to 
manage money in such a way as to get a significantly better return than the world. Uh, then I believe in extreme diversification. I mean, if it, so I believe 98 or 99 percent, maybe more than 99 percent of people who invest uh, should extensively diversify and not trade. So in, that leads them to an index fund type of a decision with very low cost. Because all they're going to do is own a part of America. And they made a decision that owning a part of America is worthwhile. I don't quarrel with that at all. That is the way they should approach it unless they want to bring an intensity to the game to make a decision and start evaluating businesses. But once you're in the business of evaluating businesses and, and you decide that you're going to bring the effort and intensity and, uh, uh, and time involved to get that job done, then I think that diversification is a terrible mistake in, in, to any degree. And uh, I got asked that question when I was at SunTrust the other day. And uh, if you really know businesses, you probably shouldn't own more than six of them. I mean, if you can identify six wonderful businesses, that is all the diversification you need. And you're going to make a lot of money. And I will guarantee you that going into a seventh one is going to, rather than putting more money in your first one, it's got to be a terrible mistake. Very few people have gotten rich on their seventh best idea. You know, but a lot of people have gotten rich on their best idea. Yeah. So I, I, would, uh, I would say that for anybody working with normal capital who really knows the businesses they've gone into, a six is plenty. And, uh, and I probably have half of it in what I liked best. I don't diversify personally. I mean, and, and uh, uh, all the people I know that have done well, with the exception of, well, we mentioned Walter Schloss here earlier. Walter diversifies a lot. He owns a little of everything. I call him Noah. You know, he's got two of everything. <laughs> okay, my next issue is stay away from companies that have a lot of debt. And again, this is another um, aspect of reducing risk. Companies that are very high leveraged, they things could be bad, things could turn bad. And as Peter Lynch said, there's never been a company that went bankrupt without any debt. Companies could use leverage in a very good way, but it could also be a very uh, big risk factor. So I don't like investing in companies that have a lot of debt. What's a lot of debt? So Benjamin Graham in, writes in his book in uh, um, uh, Interpretation of Financial Statements, he, he writes that I think that a good ratio should be that the company is a company's EBIT should be three to four times more than its um, uh, interest expenses. That means what the company is earning after its operations, before uh, interest and taxes, should cover the interest expense three to four times. He he goes over there between bonds and preferred stocks, whatever. Well, this could be something everyone have a different personal feel about it, but the company should be in a good position that the debt shouldn't be uh, something scary that if something goes bad, if rates go up, then the company will be in a problem. And I want to bring here a clip of Walter Schloss, which he says uh, about um, companies with a lot of debt. You know, what process did you follow to minimize any mistakes? I know mistakes are unavoidable in valuations and uh, security uh, collection, I guess. Uh, what steps did you follow to minimize any mistakes? I don't like to lose money. And therefore, I try to buy stocks which I think are somewhat protected on the downside, and then the upside sort of takes care of itself. So the main thing, I think, is to look for companies which don't have a lot of debt. The idea of buying a company with a large amount of debt, even though I, uh, it, it could work out well because of the leverage, I don't like it, so I look for companies that are selling new at new lows. Well, when you buy a stock at a new low, it usually has problems. So I don't like debt. Uh, debt gets people in a lot of trouble, as you know, if you read about MBIA and these other companies that have lent money and, and then find out they're in really in trouble. So I like buying companies which are usually a lot of simple capital. They don't have a lot of debts. Okay, my next issue is never invest in companies with unethical management. And I think this is a very profound um, and important issue. Um, I can make a whole long subject about it. I'll just uh, keep it simple. So there's a wide, range, a wide range of issues concerning this topic. Uh, some management are outright crooks, and you don't want to get into bed with crooks. And some aren't crooks. It's just not ethical. They're unethical. They they they, they toe the line. They make you know, 
uh, all these great areas and some are just incompetent but the problem with unethical management is that they can screw the investor in in ways they haven't thought of it, it, you can never you have no idea what you're working with when you, with someone who's who's a crook yeah you can have everything could be good the company you're buying a dollar for half a dollar you're buying an amazing company if they're crooks they could screw you in any ways you have no idea how it's going to come so that's a risk factor that's impossible to predict so that's why uh, for me it's it you can't invest in companies that have unethical management so you know warren buffett says that if it's a great company it's a great business that even a fool could run then you don't care the management's the best you don't have to even you don't need the management to be the best of the best if it's a great company but if it's not the best company in the world and you, you for sure never would want to get associated with unethical management and if it's a great business then okay so social management will also be good the only people who could invest in companies that have uh, managers who are crooks or or, or who are unethical is uh, activist managers like Carl Icahn or I don't know Bill Ackman that they could go they're willing to fight uh, the management in, in in courts for years that's something else but for the average investor just never invest in a company with unethical management okay point number seven don't get emotional attached emotionally attached to investments and I said I'm not going to bring in the issue in this list of, of of personalities and characters but this is something else every person is emotional a person is never can never be a computer. Everyone has emotions, so I'm not speaking about how to take care of emotions or what's good and what's bad in emotions and investing. I'm just saying you have to keep the emotions out of investing as much as possible. So the company doesn't belong to you. It's not your baby. The stock doesn't care about you. You shouldn't care about the stock. Don't get emotionally attached to the company. And and, and the problem with emotions is that emotions could cloud a human judgment. If, you, if the second your emotions are starting to get mixed into your investments, you could do bad judgments, bad decisions. You're buying a bad stock because you, you think emotions is a great company. You're selling a, a company which you shouldn't sell because of emotions. So keep emotions out of your investment. And and what it, what it means is that if if you feel a, some emotional urge to buy or to sell a stock, the probably the, the best thing you should do is to stop yourself and say, wait a second. I'm going to let my emotions pass, and then I'm going to do what I want to do. Maybe I'm going to lose more money, maybe not. But what's for sure is if you, you're trading, buying or selling, and when, when you're emotionally, you have some emotional urge, that, that, that that's that's not good. Wait till your emotions pass, and then do whatever you want to do. Think about it rationally. And another thing, if you mix emotion with investing, you won't be capable of realizing you were wrong. That's one thing, because you're emotionally attached to the company. And another thing, you wouldn't be able to realize you were wrong and to cut losses on time. Some people invest in stocks and they emotionally, they fell in love with the company and they waited way too long until they came to the realization they were wrong and they sold the stock. Another thing about emotions, don't fall in love with the company. And what it means is, even if it's a great company and everything's all great, everything's going good, everything is going the way you thought about it, don't fall in love with the company. Companies, businesses, they're very dynamic. Things can change very, very quickly. You always have to be on watch to check if everything is the way it is and to recheck and recheck and recheck the company again and again. If you fall in love with the stock and you just say, okay, let it drift away, everything's good, you wouldn't realize when things change. And you need to realize that things are changing before the stock prices goes crashing down. So that's why you have to be always on the watch for your stocks and do not fall in love with them. Um... Okay, issue number eight. Never speculate only rational calculations. This is also another very important issue, in my opinion. Is that investment needs to be based on rational calculations. And what that means is, one, hoping isn't investing. If you're hoping a company is going to get out of its troubles, or if you're hoping this, hoping that, hoping isn't investing. That's number one. So you have to have a rational calculation is this a good investment or is this a bad, bad investment? Should I buy or should I sell? Keep hope out of it. It's not about emotions. It's not. It's just that some people they they say, okay, I, I don't want to sell it because I, I hope it's going to become better. It's not even if they're emotionally uh, attached to the company and they're not uh, uh, um, doing the calculations based on emotions, but they they're, they're doing things because they're hoping things will change. That's not that's not uh, investing. That's speculating. Uh, it's even worse than speculating. It's just it's just hope. That's number one. Number two, speculating isn't value investing. Again, you have to have rational calculations about the metrics, about the facts, about what you know about the company, what you don't know about the company. Speculating is not value investing. 
So if you want to project uh, future growth for the company, future incomes, whatever it is, it has to be based on common sense and rational fundamentals. It can't be based on speculations that you have no idea if they're right or wrong. And and even after you do rational calculations, you still need to apply margin of safety, but not to overpay for a company or whatever it is. But the, the main issue is you have to have rational calculations, not speculations, not hoping, and not projecting things you have no idea if it's true or not. Another thing, if an investor finds himself thinking of a company, the company, he thinks the company can do like this. He thinks maybe the company will be able to do like this. That's not value investing. That's speculating. The company is doing this. The company isn't doing this. Not the company could do this or the company might do this. That should always be like a bonus. I have a great investment. I have a great company. And besides that, the company also maybe would have a future growth or maybe have another thing. Okay, that's good. But you can't base the investment on... Um, uh, on, on, because you think maybe the company would do this or maybe the company would do that. Okay, my next issue is never stop learning. Now, this is already like the, the latest uh, uh, parts of the of this list. It's like it's like the extras. It, until here, you could be uh, you could be an average investor, a good investor. If you wanna take it a step further to become a great investor, in my opinion, you have to never stop learning. What, what does it mean never to stop learning? So. You have to expand your knowledge as much as possible. Knowledge in investing, in history of the stock market, in in your knowledge in human nature, whatever it is. Anything that has to do with investing, with the stock market, with stocks, with companies, expand your knowledge as much as possible. Never stop learning. And why is it so important? Although you could be an average investor, a good investor, but if you really want to become a greater and greater, you have to continue learning forever. So a, a novice investor is limited to, to their investment opportunities because they're limited in the circle of competence, they're limited in the knowledge and the experience, they're limited in the understanding of businesses, uh, they, they don't understand complex situations. So the more knowledge you have, the more wisdom you have, the more experience you have, and the more you have all these things, the more opportunities you have. So an investor, after two years, he can invest only a circle of competence much smaller. The more he, he, his knowledge grows, the, the, more, the more he knows about businesses, the more he understands businesses, the more opportunities he'll have. So... That's yeah, an amazing thing, and it's much more than that. It's it, it's the more experience people have, the more they're afraid to do all kind of investments because they have seen things. The more you see things, the more you, you know you understand what's a risk factor. A, 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 a novice investor would say, "This is a great company, but it's a problem," and an experienced investor would say, "You know, I saw twenty companies like that that went bankrupt," or. Young investors who never saw inflation in their life, they never saw a financial crisis in their life. They don't see all kinds of risk factors and nothing they could do about it because they've never seen it. So, <coughs> sorry. The more experience you have, the more you've seen, the more knowledge you have, the more you're afraid of all kinds of different things because you still have these things came out, come out wrong. That's why you have to uh, expand your knowledge because the more time you've been investing, the more risk factors you know, so you have to have on the other side of it, to, to expand the knowledge to be able to have more opportunities, which because a lot of things you, you, which you would have invested 10 years ago or 20 years ago, you're not going to invest later on in your life. So that's why you have to continue on to learn as much as possible. And another thing about uh, Never Stop Learning is, I don't remember exactly where I saw this, I saw this in some lecture of Joel Greenblatt, he said that the more companies and investors studied, the more likely in the future they'll find themselves saying this like this. Oh, I remember I saw exactly such a kind of a thing in that and that company. So that's an amazing thing. Like the first time you see something, it's very hard to analyze it. But once you saw it again and again and again, you have much faster, you know how to say, okay, this is a bad thing, or this is a great thing, or this is a good thing, because you saw it already one time in your life. And I want to bring here a, a clip of Don Yachtman. He, he says there's no substitute for knowledge. I, I actually, I I'll, I'll, I'll like to say better, there's no substitute for wisdom, but wisdom comes from knowledge, So, and you need knowledge and you need wisdom, so it's, it's together, each one by itself isn't worth very much. And I want to bring you also a clip of Charlie Munger about uh, never to stop learning. But I think there's no substitute for knowledge in assessing risk correctly. Uh, we're not perfect, nobody can predict the future with absolute certainty, uh, but we are very uh, adamant about controlling risk and uh, for our clients to the best of our ability. Charlie? Yeah, well, of course, I've watched Warren all these decades, 
and he's learned a hell of a lot, even the last 20 or 30 years. So it's, it's a game of continuing to learn, and he can denigrate this little frou-frou that enables him to pick the biggest oil company in China or this or that. Uh, but those basic principles alone that he knew a long time ago wouldn't have given him the ability to make the recent investment decisions as well as he's made them. It's a lifelong game, and if you don't keep learning, uh, other people will pass you by. I would say temperament so still is the most important one, you, Charlie? Yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah. But temperament alone won't do it. No, temperament you, alone won't do it. You that. have to have the the temperament and the right basic idea, and then you have to keep at it with a lot of curiosity for a long, long time. Okay, my last point is don't be a copycat. And I think this is something that a lot of people forget. And what I mean by that is like this. If we choose to be stock pickers and not passive investors, we have to give a justification for all our work and our time that we invest in picking stocks. Why is this worth it more than just doing an index? And basically, we want to do this because you want to have high returns in the index. And if you want to have high returns in the index, then you have to be more than the average. To be more than the average, you can't just do what everyone else is doing. You can't just copycat. You say, okay, I want to be like Warren Buffett. You're not going to be like Warren Buffett. You're totally different than him. You're not going to be like Charlie Munger. You're not going to be something different. And so if you want to be a stock picker and not a passive investor, you have to find your own way. And I think this is very, very critical. Maybe it's not a basic principle of value investing, but if you want to be, it's a basic principle, in my opinion, of value investor. You're never going to be a great value investor if you're going to be trying to be a copycat. The only um, investor I know who's has succeeded in being copycat is uh, Monish Prabhai, in my opinion. I think he's very, very unique in that he's a very uh, successful cloner. But besides that, I, I, no, no, no one's no one's the same thing. Um, so I'm going to just read out a few a few of these points. Learning from great investors is very, very important. They have the knowledge, they have the wisdom, they have the experience. You, ha you have to learn from them. But if an investor is choosing to be a stock picker and not a passive investor, then they have to carve their own path in value investing. And it's the same thing about trading and speculating. If you want to be a speculator also, don't try to be like someone else. You have to find your own way. You know, what, what works for, 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 for Soros or for someone, for Bruce Covey doesn't mean it would work for you. They have a different temperament. They have a different personality. You have to figure out your own way, what works for you. Another thing, it's foolish to think that the strategy that works best for Warren Buffett will work best for you. And it's not only because of the amounts of money that he has in his portfolio that he has to do for different kinds of things. It's you don't have the same personality and character. And some things he, he would try away from because he, he, does, he doesn't feel good with it. And for you, it will be very good. He doesn't like, uh, let's say, shorting stocks. But some value investors have no problem with it and made a lot of money shorting stocks. And so on. It goes on full of different things. The circle of competence. He thinks maybe he doesn't do because it's out of a circle of competence. And as, as I said, circle of competence is only in kind of companies, industries you invest, also the strategy you use for investing. And so that's why don't, don't try to copy him and don't try to copy anyone else for that same point. And another big issue, in my opinion, is never take any advice, even from the great investors with face value. You can hear a, a lot of great investors saying all different kinds of things. Never take it as is. You always have to think, maybe this advice or this rule doesn't apply in a certain time, in a certain way, in a certain circumstances. So you always have to think, like, why, why, why? Maybe this time is different. Maybe this, this circumstance is different. Maybe this time it would be smart to do something else. And also, maybe, just maybe, sometimes they're not exactly telling you the entire truth. And I'm not saying they're lying. And what I mean to say is, it's not only that they have secrets that they want to keep for themselves. Sometimes they, they don't want to say th certain things for, for, for certain reasons. Anyone who has just a little bit um, common sense can see that Warren Buffett uh, stays very, he's very, very shy of criticizing people. And I don't mean he's shy. I mean he doesn't want to do it. He wants to keep himself a very nice name. He doesn't want to get into fight with people. And he would never criticize, I, I'm not, never say never, I'm saying you wouldn't hear him criticizing the Fed or the government or different kinds of things. That doesn't mean he, he doesn't think they're wrong, right? So I heard a, a once an analyst saying he doesn't listen to what Buffett says, he listens to what Buffett does. And that's a, a major thing. I already a few times I came into all different kinds of things which I, I, I think to myself, 
Buffett is saying one thing, but he has a lot of different other things that, he, that he's thinking inside, which he isn't telling the people. He isn't telling the public. And I'll conclude this whole video at this point. I, I, I studied a lot of value investors, and I still haven't found two great value investors or even speculators that have the same investment philosophy and strategy. Maybe they're similar, but they're not the same. I, I'm not going to get into this whole thing, but out of all the value investors I studied, that each one has their own path, each one has their own way, each one has their own philosophy. Even if you have two investors who have a pretty similar strategy, the philosophy could be, di be different. And sometimes you have two people with the same philosophy, but the strategy is different. And so I think any person who decides to be a stock picker and not a passive index investor, they can be a copycat and they have to ca carve out their own path in value investing. That will be the only way to success. If not, it's just a waste of time. Put your money in the index and that's it. Thank you very much and I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll be very happy to hear your thoughts in the comments what you think is very important uh, principles in value investing. Maybe you think there's things that are more important and there's a lot of other things which I didn't mention in this list and some of them it's because for me it's easier to take care of them and for me it's not such a big issue. Some of them because I think they're less important than these issues that I brought up and but I'll be very happy to hear your thoughts and, um, and another thing I just want to say I this list that I make that I made, I try every every once in a while, maybe once a week or once or twice, once or two weeks, to read it over again and rethink it. And because the big part of value investing is a lot of times you know a lot of things. You have the knowledge, maybe you have the wisdom, you have the experience, but sometimes when it comes to apply it at the right time, people forget about all the things and they get emotionally invested in things or whatever it is. It's, it's not enough to have the knowledge and to have the wisdom. You also have to know how to apply it in real time so that's why i think it's very 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 important to re read this again and again or rethink it the whole time remind yourself constantly constantly the basics of value investing so when it comes time to apply all these principles you shouldn't get mixed up and do the wrong thing thank you very much and hope you enjoyed this video now if you like this video don't forget to smash the like button and to subscribe to the channel thank you very much